Hey guys, welcome to the Guy Blog Podcast. As always, your host Orlando here. And we're going to be talking Dana White today. The reason we're going to be talking Dana White is very simple. I am a little tired of Dana White. And I've been watching this whole um, Mayweather, um, McGregor buildup. They're different stops. I've seen everything going on. Um, and basically, since I follow MMA, seeing how Dana White, since the UFC has been sold, because he's always been known to be a little bit of a bully. He's always been known to be a little bit of a jerk, some would say an asshole, some would say much worse things about him. I know him as, or I see him as a businessman, a promoter, and, you know, there's a bit of BS, or quite a bit of BS, built into every fighting promoter. Um, There's a bit of, of, you know, aggressive alpha mentality, because you're dealing with fighters, So you can't be, you know, have a meek attitude and then expect um, fighters to to not go crazy and making crazy proclamations or talking crazy uh, shit about you. But in seeing Dana White, he's had that, but usually he's had it with a cause. When he talks something about a fighter, it was either to motivate or even embarrass them into taking a fight into you know, defending their title into putting themselves in a situation that is better for for the company than it is for the fighter. That's understandable. It was also done many a times for the fighters to take this somewhat and at one point very much struggling MMA promotion, you know, ahead of themselves because if the promotion doesn't grow, the fighter is screwed. So fine. Um, Having Dana White be somebody that has to be there prodding fighters, pushing fighters, and kind of cornering fighters to take certain fights, to fight certain dates, and to fight certain people was annoying, was maybe, you know, not the best building the happiest roster in the world. But having a burgeoning company that needed to grow and become a global brand and become what it is today, that is what was necessary. You know, it's unlike boxing where you might have two boxers that that make the top 95% of income on a fight card. um, In MMA, it's spread out a little more. And the only way you're going to get to to see superstars is by making them and by making them have interesting fights. And honestly... The only way that fans were going to follow MMA was to have a full fight card full of interesting fights. Now, since the UFC has sold, the UFC is a global brand now. The UFC is the number one MMA promotion in the world. The UFC is, well, they're in the lead. And they are what everybody else follows. So... You could be a fan of Bellator, you could be a fan of World Series of Fighting, you could be a fan of 1FC, and watch those, and but you'll still know what's going on in the UFC. However, you could be a fan of UFC and not have any idea what these other MMA brands that I mentioned are, who they are, where they are, who the hell fights there. So, that's part of the luxury of being number one. Now... That's part of the luxury of being number one, but something else that comes with being number one is you're held to a higher standard. You know, you can't act as a $4 billion company the same way you acted when you were a $2 million company or when you were a company that was almost bankrupt. So, two completely different worlds, and I'm getting the feeling that Dana White might not be built for both of them. As a promoter, honestly... And some might agree or some, some might not. I believe that Scott Coker has the temperament, the right attitude, and creates relationships in, in a way that feed more into taking a $4 billion brand um, MMA company and turning it into a league and turning it into the official um, you know, standard bearer for the sport. And that's what the UFC isn't. They're on the point of becoming that, but they're not there. Which is, the UFC is MMA. 
They are not. They are not yet. They have not reached MLB, NFL, NBA status, but they desperately want to. They sold it with that vision, and you know the new owners, WME, bought it with that intent of getting this even closer to becoming a league, making it into an $8 billion, $12 billion brand that they could either sell or just reap the benefits of being the owners of you know, sport number four or five or six in the states behind the NBA and the MLB and, and the NFL and NASCAR and all of that. So, you know, Dana White's attitude has only before was something that you would see and, and you'd say, well, you know, he's being an asshole, he's being this, he's doing that, you know, but he's a promoter, he's a fighting promoter, and you get all the reasons that I've already mentioned. But now, when you're a $4 billion company, everything is under the microscope. People know exactly what you're doing. They hear all the stories, and at points, it becomes ridiculous, the lengths that he goes to. But even more so, the lengths that he goes to to get revenge or payback or to embarrass somebody that's not doing what he wants, you know, it just looks Bush League. You know, when you're scrapping to make the UFC work, it was understandable. I mean, it was either the UFC or the fighter, and Dana White is 110% on the side of the UFC. You know, it's the UFC has to succeed if the fighter has any chance of making a career out of this. So it was fair back then because even if fighters didn't like it, what he was doing was for the benefit of all of them. You know, even if he had a vested interest, a $400 million vested interest, in making the company succeed, the truth is, it was for MMA. You know, if the company grows, the sport grows, and what fighters make grow. And they can make a real career out of, out of it, where they don't have to be like Demetrius Mighty Moss Johnson was, where he used to work and still fight, and used to work and was going for championship fights while still holding down a job, so he had to work a 9 to 5 or the equivalent of that, and then go train for three to four hours, and then go home to his wife and kid. Like, they had to do all of that while being, you know, in the UFC trying to make fighting a career. And now, somebody like Mighty Mouse, who's sponsored by Microsoft, who, you know, is on Twitch all the time, who has his own unique sponsorships and is his own brand, can just make fighting 100% what he does. That's his career. And... The UFC growing and what Dana White did at the beginning and did for many, many years have allowed that to happen, have allowed Mighty Mouse to, to make that change and that shift. However, we cannot ignore the fact that now that you're a $4 billion brand, people are going to look at somebody like Mighty Mouse and say, well, who is he? They're going to see, well, this is one of the most decorated fighters in martial arts history. This is one of the best fighters in martial arts history. He's a UFC champ. He, he's defended his title six, seven, eight, nine, ten consecutive times. He's, you know, breaking records left and right. He's an exciting fighter. I don't care what you say about his size. He can definitely be promoted. And people are, are going to look at it and say, especially like five years from, from now, wow, the UFC and Dana White couldn't promote him. They couldn't promote everything he did I mean GSP at the end of his career was known as a boring fighter and they promoted the hell out of him but Mighty Mouse they don't know what to do with him that's that's just ridiculous you know and it's a chicken and the egg problem where the UFC says well they don't make money that division doesn't make money but how is that division supposed to make money if you've never invested anything in promoting it so it's ridiculous Second of all, going on TV, talking to reporters, and embarrassing your champion. Again, ridiculous and looks Bush League. It's just beyond ridiculous. It's, it's, it's the NBA, it's the owner of the Cavaliers, you know, writing a letter, talking shit about LeBron. It's just, you know, it's what everybody says. Thank your blessings that LeBron decided to come back to your team. So it's the same thing. It's the NBA talking about, you know, James Harden and saying he's a shitty player. But it's not the NBA. 
it's the Houston Rockets saying it. You know, and he plays for them. And they have to count on him. They don't do that. Teams don't do that. Hell, Phil Jackson just lost his job for, you know, talking shit about Carmelo Anthony. Which, after doing that, you can't even trade him. And Kristaps Porzingis, which basically is your future. So you're talking shit instead of nurturing the relationship with your future superstar that you should build around. Except Dana White has several options for superstars. And instead of, of, of building, because when you're a $2 million, $10 million, $100 million, $200 million, $500 million brand, you could do that with one or two superstars, you know, in the sport. But when you're a $4 billion brand, if you're counting on just one Conor McGregor and one Ronda Rousey, and that's it, you're in the position that you are in now, where Conor gets to do whatever he wants, you know, Ronda decided to retire and you can't do anything about it, you have John Jones coming, coming back, whose fall from grace has been just unbelievable to watch. Um, how somebody can mess up that much, that consistently. And yet, after saying, because he's such a, a mess up, he's such a F up, saying that he will never headline a, another event, as soon as he's coming back, he's headlining, because you don't have a choice, because you don't have any other money makers. That's your fault. That's your fault, bro. Because seeing Dana White go that Bush League into Mighty Mouse instead of building him, somebody that's been consistent, somebody that, that's been exciting to watch, and somebody that has always been there for the company is ridiculous. Then Amanda Nunez um, pulls out of a fight. I don't agree with it. I wanted to see her fight, and I understand, you know, my father also deals with chronic sinusitis. So I understand how hard it is, but I still wanted her to fight, and I wanted her to have that fighting spirit. But besides whether it's right or wrong, whether she should have fought or shouldn't have fought, it's really more about what happened afterward. Instead of Dana White coming out and saying she was cleared to fight, however, she did not feel well, so she didn't fight. You know, that's their decision. They have to live with that. But... Um, we will see, and I will talk to her and try to get this so it doesn't repeat them itself and see what, what made this situation occur. Maybe it was weight cutting. Maybe it was, you know, practice. We, we got to get to the bottom of this, but we'll find out. Amanda is a champion. She retired Ronda Rousey. She retired Misha Tate. So, you know, it's not that she doesn't have a fighting spirit. She must have been really, really feeling it to not be ready to fight the day of. Is that what Dana White said? Nope. Dana White comes out there, a champion that represents the LGBT community that, you know, has retired two of the greatest female fighters the company has ever had, one after the other, and comes out there and says she was cleared to fight. She should have fought. She didn't fight. She basically said that she's chicken. And said, I will never have her headlining another card. This bluster, this bombastic statement is ridiculous from the president of a company. The main promoter that is trying to get this company from 4 to $8 billion, To say that you're going to, for the second time, take another champion and basically not promote them. Because of, that's what you're saying. If you're saying Amanda Nunez will never be a, a main eventer, you know, she will not headline another pay-per-view, all you're saying is, we're not going to promote her. We're not going to promote her fights with the same enthusiasm that we promote this John Jones fight. With the same enthusiasm that we promote a Conor McGregor fight. The problem is, after those two names that I just said, the UFC has nobody that Dana White likes that can be promoted in that way. Who else does he like? Paige Van Zandt? Great, great fighting spirit. She's still working on getting everything together, but she lost. And she's not a great fighter yet. Will she be? I think so. I think she has. she's a superstar in the making. Keyword, in the making, in the process of, not in title contention yet. 
she's at least a year away from that. You know, Sage Northcutt, same situation. The kid has all the upside in the world, but is still a year or two away from getting there. So you see this and you're like, dude, you're counting on Conor McGregor and Conor McGregor is on taking a boxing match. He's going to get everything he wants and you think that getting 40, 50 million now is a benefit to the company. Fine, it is. But you need to get money out of these other fighters, which you can't maximize if you as the head of the company keep talking shit. And it it's just not a good look. And I brought up Scott Coker because things are looking so much better on the Bellator side. And one of the main things is every time Scott Coker is on TV, every time he's interviewed, the man looks professional. He seems like he's running a $4 billion company, you know, and he's not even doing it with like nothing speak, which is what I call when, you know, they give an interview and all of the answers are so generic and so boring. No, he answers questions. He talks about his fighters. He talks about his company. He talks about his strategy. He says what he thinks. But instead of being Dana White and going, you know, 50% positive, 50% negative, 80% negative, 20% positive, he finds what's positive about his fighters, all of them, and he focuses on that and he focuses the attention on that, which is to the benefit of the fighter and it maximizes their earning potential, keeps them happy, and also, by the way, maximizes his company's earning potential because the more valuable a fighter looks, the more valuable he is to the company and the more value he adds. But if you have 10 fighters and you're doing that with all 10 of them, and then you're doing it with 20 and 30, it doesn't matter if the value of each fighter is, you know, is increasing, but just, you know, by little fractions, the whole is adding a tremendous value to the company, but you get an, another benefit. Unlike the UFC where if Ronda Rousey retires, you end up screwed because you just lost two of your million plus buys pay-per-view pay-per-views in right now in Bellator with somebody like Scott Coker if he loses one superstar he can say well I have 10 more you know and behind those 10 I have another 10 that I'm building and then behind those 10 there's another 10 we just signed that, that are on their way up. And there's another 10 that we signed three years ago that we've been bringing up through the ranks. You know, he's got names upon names that might not be well known now. But as the company profile grows, a lot of them will be known. And a lot of them will be a lot of value. And the UFC, you will see them, mark my words, with this freaking attitude that Dana White has. He's not building superstars. They're going to be losing their biggest names. And then, yes, they've done it before. They've poached big names from, you know, from what used to be Strike Force. They've poached big names from other organizations to bring them in. They're going to try to start poaching names from Bellator in a year. I believe in a year, year and a half. They will start trying to, you know, sign the biggest names from Bellator and bring them over to the UFC, which they've already kind of done. But it's going to get harder. And more importantly, it's going to get more expensive because fighters are going to look and say, while that Reebok deal is in place, I can make more money in Bellator. You know, well, why do I want to be champion for this organization if all I'm going to get is if I get sick or something happens, I'm going to get Dana White talking about what a piece of shit I am, like he did to Demetrius Johnson, one of the most decorated fighters in the history of MMA. And like he did to Amanda Nunez, who retired two legends. I mean, if he does that to them, what's he going to do to me that came over from a company that he doesn't like? What, 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 how is he going to promote me if I lose? He's going to talk about, oh, well, you see, it's just it's not the same. When they come to the UFC, they came into the real MMA world. It's, it's, and, you, you know, we might see this as fans and say, oh, no, that's not it. He's always looking for the best for the company. But that's the problem. Before Dana White had a motivation, and the motivation was, I want to do the biggest thing for the UFC 
so that the UFC can prosper because the company is worthless and it needs to gain value. He got it to $4 billion. And out of that, all through that ride, he at least got the high of, you know, I'm the face, I'm in the news, I'm number one, and I'm the man. Now, he has all of that plus $400 million. What else motivates him? Well, at now he's promoting Conor McGregor's boxing match. Okay, but how does that benefit the UFC? In reality, it doesn't. Unless McGregor wins, it really doesn't. And if he wins, it'll be a byproduct of what Dana White really cares about, which is he's part of this press tour. You know, his name will be linked, you know, as a promoter into making one of the biggest fights in the history of, of well, you know, of fighting, of all fight martial arts and fighting um, disciplines. But how does that really, you know, Dana White becoming a bigger promoter um, help the UFC? It doesn't. It really doesn't. You know, him setting up this McGregor thing does nothing to help the UFC. It's a pet project for him. It's a very lucrative project. It'll be a lucrative project where it'll make in the present money for the UFC. But unless Conor McGregor wins, there really is no upside. And a lot of people would tell you that that wasn't a risk worth taking. But it's a Vegas risk, which is what the Fertitas used to take. Which is, you know, hey, you might have 2% odds of winning. But if it hits, it hits big. The problem is, the Fertitas aren't there. So Dana White doesn't have anybody reining him in. So this fight gets made. If Conor loses, MMA loses a little bit. The UFC loses more than MMA. But if Conor wins, yeah, the UFC wins and, and they get benefit. But even that, it's temporary. Because then you'll just have 10 more MMA fighters going to boxing. And 9 out of 10 will get beat. And... That won't look good. You know, it won't look good in the long run. And it doesn't really add value to the UFC. So I, I just don't get it. I've said, and I will, I could be wrong. And, I, and if that's the case, I, you know, will have no problems in saying it to his face. But I believe this is the lar last, sorry, this will be the last large thing of significance or event of significance that is you know that uh, how do I put it basically this will be the last real special event that Dana White will have done that he will be remembered for meaning you know UFC 100 creating the ultimate fighter um, TV show um, you know, putting a, a Ronda Rousey, the trajectory of Conor McGregor, which really will belong more to McGregor than anybody will give Dana White any credit for that. Um, this will be the last significant thing that he will do as a promoter. And afterwards, I'm not saying that he won't do anything. He'll be doing, but just with the attitude he has, with still wanting to act like he's an asshole with disparaging, demeaning, talking way too much shit about his fighters and about his champions. I just don't see him pulling off another huge event besides what? Another Conor McGregor fight? And let's be serious. Anything Conor McGregor related, the credit goes to where it should properly go, where it righteously should go, which is Conor McGregor. He's built this world for himself. He's built this opportunity for himself. You know, this is not Dana White. So, if you take away Conor McGregor, the buck stops at what Dana did with Ronda Rousey, which is also a lot of her own doing, but we can give him credit for the opportunity and then for promoting her. But after that, take away Conor, and this event, him being involved, is of significance. I don't see him doing anything else of this level, not with the attitude he has. Not with this fuck you attitude that he has towards his own fighters in his own company. And that's what pisses me off. If he wanted to have it with fighters that are leaving, fighters that are out, fighters that, that never fight. No, no, no. He's having this with fighters 
DJ and Amanda are two examples of fighters that are always willing to fight, always put on a show, always have good fights, and don't give the UFC problems. And these are the fighters that are his champions, and yet he's decided to disparage. It's ridiculous. So that's how I feel about that. Um, guys, let me know what you think. I could keep going on and on, but then I'll be rambling more than I already did about the subject. But it's part of the reason that I do feel strongly about the direction that Bellator is going versus where the UFC is going. Um, I'm going to be writing an article about that. I think it'll be a really good one. Uh, well, I am writing currently that article, but um, it'll be a good one. And I'll once I have it done, I'll do an episode about it. But the point is, these two companies seem to be going in two different directions. And it's because of how the head of these companies are behaving and how they're doing business. You know, Dana White isn't, with this Connor thing, he's not even focused on the UFC. So that in itself should tell you, you know, how much he cares. I don't know. You guys might think I'm wrong. Let me know. You guys might think that it's quite the opposite, that Dana White will take the UFC to the next level. Hey, leave a comment. Contact me. Call me. You know, email me, Orlando at theguyblog.com, Twitter at theguyblog, Instagram at theguyblog, and if anything else, and if all else fails, like I said, email me. If you guys like this podcast, go on iTunes, five-star review, it'll really help, you know, in getting more people to know about this podcast, it'll help get us out there, and as always, talk to you soon, take care.